bright and bushy-tailed. I think we're in for a very interesting um, hour. And what we're going to do is have a debate. Uh, and the debate is entitled that this house believes that it's correct for patients having circumcision that they're consented uh, for death. And basically, we're using circumcision as a paradigm, really, for, for minor surgery. So we have a distinguished faculty um, here this morning. We have um, John Raynard from the Churchill Hospital, who will be ably backed up by uh, David Cranston. And then opposing will be Jonathan Glass from Guy's and St. Thomas's, and uh, also by Mark Speakman, who is based in Taunton, and as you all know, is a former president of the uh, association. Just to set the context uh, for, for this, and you saw this uh, slide, uh, I think, yesterday, um, cl clinical negligence claims in urology are actually quite significant. And throughout the NHS, there's a big issue with uh, negligence claims, uh, with the estimated cost having doubled since 2010. And the total liabilities for the NHS in relation to claims amount to some 65 billion. And the estimated cost on a yearly basis is between 15.7 and 33 uh, billion, uh, million. And this uh, varies by trust. So you'll have seen this in terms of the GERF report that Simon Harrison presented yesterday, that the estimated legal costs uh, for each trust vary dramatically, with the national average per admission somewhere in the region of 38, uh, 38 pounds. But you can see quite a wide uh, variety. So the question before we get going, and I'd like you to take your apps out now if you would, we're going to ask two questions, one at the beginning and one at the end. Um, it's with respect to your current practice, when patients give consent for routine circumcision, do you discuss the possibility of death with the patient? Yes or no? So if you could start voting now. I presume it has. So can, can we bring that up? Are we struggling with this? <coughs> ah, here we go. So, 11% yes and 89% no, so that sets the context. So the order of speakers uh, this morning is going to be John Raynard, who um, will uh, be first up. And so, John, I'd like to ask you to the podium. Uh, you're welcome to put questions if you could write those on your iPad or on your iPhone, and then if there's time, we'll try and come to them later on. John, you're welcome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, as some of you will know, um, I have a fairly large medical legal practice, and I um, have and I continue to have lots of contact with lawyers and barristers, and I listen to their comments on our profession. I'm also um, a co-author of this little book, Urology and the Law, because I think that prevention is better than cure. And you must um, forgive this blatant self-promotion, um, but sales of the book um, are not quite what I told the publishers they would be. <laughs> um, that was my income for a period of about six months or so. Exactly a penny a book. It's just not worth it, is it? Um, and that's a shame, because this book has been described by our own journal as a gem of a publication and by the Journal of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh as a book that all, not just us, but all aspiring and practicing surgeons should read. And also of note and of relevance to this debate is the fact that James Badenock QC is a co-author, and of course James Badenock was lead counsel in the Montgomery case. Um, so let's uh, talk about the historical approach to consent for circumcision, and I thought I'd quote Bill Dunsmuir, who is the intellectual face of British urology, even though he left the pub at five o'clock this morning. Um, and Bill, writing 20 years ago uh, about the history of circumcision and quoting a biblical reference, stated this, that we mark your son who belongs to us, not to you, i.e., 
we will decide what you need to be told, not you. Um, that might be described as the classical approach to uh, consent, quite literally, because Hippocrates said that it was probably best to conceal things from patients because it would upset them. So let's look at what um, people around the world in different uh, countries do. What is their approach to consent for circumcision? Well, if you work in Queensland, in Australia, for example, uh, you will... Um, be quite explicit in your approach to consent, and you will say that death as a result of this procedure is possible. If you work at Brigham and Women's in Boston, um, you'll be even more explicit, and you will say that serious life-threatening bacterial infection can occur. In our own um, jurisdiction, at Guy's and Thomas's, correct me if I'm wrong about this, Jonathan, later, is that circumcision Patients are warned that an infection at the operation site can occur. Just what an infection means um, is not uh, clarified in that consent form. Maybe they've moved on. And, of course, in our own jurisdiction, we now have the Montgomery ruling, um, which tells us that our role is to ensure that patients understand the benefits and the risks of proposed treatments, and that this role will only be performed if the information we provide is comprehensible, and I'll leave it up to you to decide whether an infection at the operation site is really comprehensible, what does that really mean? Does it portray the awfulness of soft tissue infection? If you just mention the possibility of an infection, does it give you an idea of what might happen? Montgomery, uh, um, it goes without saying, has, has really had a dramatic effect on our approach to consent, or at least it should have a dramatic effect on our approach to consent, because what it means is that Bollum, the professional standard, is now well and truly dead, and we now have a, an absolute duty of care in law to warn of material risks. So what are those risks of a Fournier's gangrene occurring after circumcision? Well, if you look at a mass voluntary circumcision program in Uganda, um, the risk was just one in 50,000. In Oxford, in 30 years, we've had just a single case about seven or eight years ago of a Fournier's gangrene after a circumcision. And that's hugely reassuring, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen, because the urologist in fulfilling their role in their duty in law um, and when they warn about risks of a, a circumcision, who would not want to be told about the risk of that happening, can be very reassuring to patients. You can say the risk is only one in 50,000. This is highly unlikely to occur. And that's an important thing because there's something about the medical profession that marks us out from all other professions. If you look at opinion poll after opinion poll, we are still regarded, our doctors and surgeons, as the most trustworthy and the most honest of all professions. It marks us out from other professions. It marks us out from those people. That's a particularly nice slide, I think, of some shifty politicians. It marks us out from the bankers, who can trust them. It marks us out from FIFA officials. And it marks us out from people who manufacture cars and who tell us that the emissions are lower than they really are. That's the thing about the medical profession. We can be trusted. We've given up a lot, ladies and gentlemen, and I think that is one thing we definitely shouldn't give up. Well, if my words are not enough, I would recommend that you listen to the words of the judges, of the, the judges themselves, because they, after all, will be the final arbiters of what should and need not be said to patients. They are, it is obvious, isn't it, the people who will judge you. Um, I want to consider in the next few slides a case that I was actually involved with as a causation expert in the Royal Courts of Justice. I was there in court, I listened to the arguments of the barristers, and I listened to the judge. Um, and in his summing up, in this case which involved discectomy, fairly routine surgery, um, this woman walks into the operating theatre and she leaves in a wheelchair and she never gets out of the wheelchair again. Her name is Mrs H. Um, and this is what the judge said in his summing up, in his judgment. She said, although I was told of the possibility of nerve damage, I did not know what this meant. 
it was not explained to me that nerve damage could mean permanent paralysis. He told me that the operation was a routine one. What a rookie mistake that is. It's the sort of thing that an SHO, were we to allow them to consent patients without full supervision, might say to a patient, it's just a routine procedure. They always write that. I always remember listening to the um, Radio 4 presenter following the death of Anthony Minghella, you remember the director of the English patient. Um, he went in for routine surgery, and unfortunately he died after routine surgery. Um, and it was almost as if the presenter was saying, why on earth, if you go in for routine surgery, should the outcome be so bad? That just shouldn't happen, should it? There's nothing routine about that. Carrying on with Mrs. H, the judge said that she said she was given a consent form to sign, but everything was a rush, and she did not pay attention to what it said. She did not recall what was discussed because she was being prepared for surgery. She did not recall any discussion about paralysis. This is just what she said. The consent form included spinal cord injury, but it did not explicitly state that she might be paralyzed. Mrs. H said that if she had known about the risk of paralysis, she would not have had the operation. And in summing up, the judge said this about the surgeon, and this is the damning statement. Whatever Mr. R's strengths as a surgeon when carrying out the operation, he was not a good communicator about the risks of operations. I find that Mrs. H did not give informed consent to the operation. If she had been given information about material risks, she would not have agreed to the operation. And in these circumstances, I give judgment for Mrs. H for the agreed sum of 4.4 million pounds. That, ladies and gentlemen, is before the barristers and the lawyers and the court fees weigh in. And I would imagine that probably adds at least a million. You might be permanently paralyzed. Five teeny tiny little words, less than five seconds, a million pounds a word, one million pounds a second out of my taxes and your taxes. Thank goodness I pay 45% tax. Thank goodness you all pay 45% tax to compensate for colleagues who find it difficult to have difficult conversations. And worse still for the surgeon, a surgeon out of touch with public opinion, judicial opinion, and the opinions of the GMC. A surgeon criticized by a judge, potentially facing a GMC investigation, and a profession seen as deciding what risks the general public should be informed of. I think there has been so much spoken about this with Chester and Afshar, and with all of these recent cases, that I think any surgeon who nowadays adopts a perfunctory approach to consent is exposing themselves to the risk of regulatory opprobrium, opprobrium from the general public, and opprobrium from judges. Now, to be criticized by a judge in a standard clinical negligence case is one thing, but to be criticized on three counts, wow, you'd have to be a pretty ballsy surgeon to expose yourself to that sort of risk. I'll leave you um, in the last couple of slides or so with the words of John De Bono, who is a leading defense QC. And this is in an, another DISC uh, case, again, in which I happen to be giving a causation uh, um, report. And so it's very contemporary. This is the way that judges are interpreting the law. This case has been described as a game changer for consent in elective surgery. So in the words of John De Bono, Justice Green, following the lead of the Supreme Court in Montgomery, has just opened the door wide open for consent claims. I anticipate that there will be many claims. Surgeons should urgently review their consenting processes. So there are two essential approaches to consent. You can bury your head in the sand and you can continue to adopt the 20th century approach or you can be very explicit and very honest about the risks of surgery and move into the 21st century. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, John. I'd like to ask uh, Jonathan Glass now to come for the rebuttal. Right. This House believes it is not correct that patients having a circumcision are consented for death. That's my stance. Before I get going, I just wonder, we're talking about risk here. Could everyone please look under their seats to make sure there's no unsuspected packages, make sure you know where the fire escapes are, because we've got to be very safe and very protected. But what I'm going to go through is medicine doing what feels right. I'm going to look at Montgomery and ask whether it should be doctors who decide what goes on in a hospital and in theatre, or whether it's lawyers. I'm going to ask, is there any benefit of experience? Is every decision that we take in our practice, uh, should that decision be taken as if a lawyer is looking over us? I'm going to review what the GMC says and look at other risks that we don't mention and don't take consent for. So, as I suspected, um, John went through Olam, Sidaway, and Montgomery. And I think it's important we get to know these rulings and dissect them out and question them to determine what we think is right in the process of consent and in the process of uh, our role. So, natural justice. First of all, why am I here? I don't do lots of medical legal work, but it's when one of my registrars came back from a course which he attended uh, and was taught by John that he said, Mr. Glass, when we're doing circumcisions in the future, I'm being told I should consent for death. I said, I didn't feel that was right. I didn't feel that was what most of urology did. And I thought we should question that. And indeed, I did question it. I asked it on Twitter and actually got exactly the same result on Twitter that we got this, today in this uh, auditorium. 88% of world urologists despite whether they live in Queensland or in, um, in the, uh, practice at the Brigham, 88% of urologists don't put death on the consent form when they're, taking death, uh, when they're taking consent for patients undergoing a circumcision. And sometimes medicine just does what feels right. We started the laparoscopic cholecystectomy because it felt right. We do minimally invasive stone surgery. We give vitamin K for neonates. And we don't mention death when we take consent for circumcision or for other minor procedures because medicine just does what feels right. We, as a medical community, have a good feel for the human condition. And I do believe it's medicine that should be shaping what we do and not lawyers. So why do I do and why do I behave like I do in theatre? I behave like I do in theatre because I've been influenced uh, and uh, informed by people like this. Uh, the great surgeons who have taught me and have uh, informed me, people like uh, Lewis Spitz at the Great Ormond Street, um, Paul Abel, Jeremy Thompson, Richard Tiptoft, they have all informed me and developed me into who I am and made me practice the way that I do. And I prefer to do what I do in theatre and practice the way I practice because of people like this and not because of people like that. And by doing what, what is being proposed, we uh, deny our patients the benefit of our experience. On the uh, left of this picture is what is called a Reynardogram. This is the kind of uh, picture that um, John uh, has published to say that he produces when he is describing to a patient the procedure of ureteroscopy. And what it does is list every possibility, every option for the patient, in this case with a lower pole stone, but generally fails to give advice. Now, we get told that we can't give advice. We, don't want, we shouldn't be paternalistic. It's slightly great that it's the legal, imp legal profession that tells us that we shouldn't be paternalistic and we shouldn't give advice. One of the most paternalistic advice-giving professions that there is. But it's important that we give individualized thoughtful, nuanced assessment of the patient in front of us based on wisdom, based on increasing experience, understanding of the human, human condition and utilizing our knowledge and expertise. I don't believe giving an opinion is wrong. And with the Reynardogram as the paradigm,
it doesn't matter whether you're actually 30 years into your training or on day one of your training. You can do the same thing, draw it all out, and let the patient make the informed decision without trying to influence them. I don't believe giving an opinion is wrong. It just as an example, in this Raynardogram, John shows that he uh, highlights lithotripsy and says it's life-threatening. We should be not paternalistic. We should be involving our patients with our decisions. And shared decision-making is all the rage. There's um, huge numbers of reports on shared decision-making in the NHS, and that's what we should be doing. It's at the crux of patient-centered care. It's a key part of uh, quality and safety in healthcare, and it's a meeting of experts, us as experts in the condition, and the patient as an expert in herself or himself. In fact, I recently had an encounter with a patient who finished it off by saying, Mr. Glass, thank you for your opinion, your advice, and your expertise. And one of the things that is striking about the medical legal rulings is they are all based on single cases. And it's based on those single cases, not on studies, not on, um, on uh, consensus views. It's based on single cases that the lawyers make these ju judgments and that to which we respond. We wouldn't do that in any other form of uh, medical practice. And I, it's important that you know Montgomery. I have dissected out Montgomery, and the next few slides are rather wordy, but they are important. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, there's a color change. I'm, so, um, the doctor is um, entitled to withhold consent uh, if he feels that if, uh, disclosing information will be seriously detrimental to the patient's health. That's important. That includes psychological well-being. A lot of the Montgomery ruling is based on this interpretation of what we do by Lord Scarman. The doctor's concern is with health and the relief of pain. These are medical objectives, but a patient may well have in mind circumstances, objectives, and values which he may reasonably not make known to the doctor. I don't believe that's generally how we practice. And not only do I not believe it, William Osler, many years ago, said the good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. We do look at the whole patient. We do look at the whole being. I don't believe Lord Scarman's interpretation of what we do is correct. And it is on this basis that Montgom the Montgomery ruling was held. Furthermore, oh, I'm sorry, there's a color change which isn't happening. I apologize. Uh, again, dissecting out Montgomery, another important point towards the end, the doctor cannot form an objective medical view of these matters and is therefore not in a position to take the right decision as a matter of clinical judgment. Again, it's th this assessment that doctors only look at pain, look at death and dying, they don't look at the whole patient. Again, and going back to one of our um, former surgeons, last former uh, uh, surgeons and physicians, a physician is obligated to consider more than a diseased organ, more even than the whole man. He must view the whole man in his world. I believe that is how medicine is practiced, and it's in this context that we should be deciding uh, what ruling, uh, what, what, how we take consent for patients, not the lawyers. Lord Bridge accepted that a risk had to be disclosed where it was obviously necessary to make an informed choice. I don't believe warning patients about death from circumcision helps them make any uh, evaluation in an informed choice. I don't believe telling a mother that their child may die when they're about to have a circumcision relaxes that mother and helps her make an informed choice about whether they should go ahead with little Johnny's circumcision or not. The GMC tells us that we, are own, we should give patients the information they want or need in a way that they can understand. Again, I'm not sure that patients need to know the risk of death in circumcision. I don't think it helps them make an informed choice. The GMC also says that no single approach to discussions about treatment or care will suit every patient or apply, or apply in all circumstances. Individual patients may want more or less information or involvement with decision making. That's absolutely key. We should be tailoring the information we're giving to the patient in front of us. And it is that nuanced consultation that we can offer to our, to our patients. 
I believe the premise on which the Montgomery ruling, a single case, was made was wrong. But even accepting the Montgomery ruling, consenting patients under circumcision for death, I believe, is wrong. We don't consent for patients being given ciprofloxacin, a 0.14 to 4% risk of uh, tendon rupture. We don't consent for catheterization, for prescribing penicillin, or the risk of cellulitis when we put in a venflon. We accept that patients take on this risk without asking for their consent. And it is risky out there. If you take the UK population as a whole, we, any one of us has a 1% chance of dying in the next year. If you drive on the road for 50 years, uh, for 85 years, sorry, for 50 years, there's a 1 in 85 chance of dying. There's a small risk of it, one of us ending up in casualty in the next year, having been hit by a mattress or a pillow. Uh, one in 50,000 chance of death on a soccer field. I've been on a soccer field when a death occurred when I was uh, at school. And there's a one in 250,000 chance of your home being hit by a crashing plane. Roughly the chance that you're going to die in an anesthetic related incident if you're otherwise fit and well. So at the heart of what we're saying is we should be looking at the doctor-patient relationship. And that relationship is based on honesty and trust. I was speaking to one of my colleagues about this, and she said, well, it's a bit like having a new boyfriend. You've got to assume from day one that you're not cheating on each other. And that's exactly as it is with our care of our patients. We've got to go into consultations not worried about being sued, but thinking about the patient's needs. Here we have a certain neurologist in a consultation, and I don't think we should practice every consultation with the uh, feeling that we've got a lawyer looking over our shoulder worried about what we're saying and how we're doing things. This is, and the same article that John has written about his Raynardogram, how he, uh, what he writes in his letters about a patient having a ureteroscopy. We went through the BAUS consent information form line by line, and I use language that I think helps you understand the medical jargon. Given the nature of your job, I explain the stents, that stent symptoms, should they occur, are described by some patients as being so severe, etc., etc., etc. I'm not saying he finishes that I've got it right, but it's an, it, it, it is an approach which he says makes him feel comfortable. And that's the thing. It's an approach which makes the uh, worried medical legal expert feel comfortable, not an approach that makes the patient feel comfortable. I, again, had a single case. I don't see why we shouldn't base our practice on single cases. It's what the lawyers do, who said to me two weeks ago, whatever decision you make, doctor, you'll be doing it in my best interests. Taking an hour to consent a patient for a ureteroscopy or circumcision isn't compatible with British healthcare. It results in other patients waiting so long to see you that that could result in, the, in those other patients' clinical deterioration. And I asked John, when do, where does our responsibility really start? Actually, the um, Center for Disease Control in the US says that infants having circumcisions don't die. And in their 2000 report, 2010 report, they discovered no circumcision-related deaths. But we do know that children and adults die on the road every day. And there is a high risk. Uh, pedestrians account for 65% of child casualties. Um, and uh, patients, both us in cars, cyclists, and pedestrians are at risk. So, John, I suggest a scenario. Here we wake up in the morning. A patient wakes up in Ancham, awaiting to have their circumcision. They have to get to the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford to meet you to have them circumcision. In fact, once they're in the hospital, that's the safest part of their day. Their circumcision isn't a risky component of their day. This is the, these are the routes that Google Maps suggests you should take to go from Ancient to the John Radcliffe Hospital. These are all the sites of fatal accidents on that journey over the last 10 years. I suggest, John, that you should be telling your patient to take this route to the hospital because that route avoids any of those uh, potential uh, sites of fatal accidents. And in fact, these accidents all occurred on any vehicle. If you only look at buses, there's only been two fatal accidents. So I think you should give your patients a timetable and tell them to get the bus to the hospital because that is much safer. And I recognize that this is going to have an impact on your consultation. <laughs>
So as well as having to do a Raynardogram for their event in hospital, you're going to have to do one for the encounter on their way to the hospital. So I thought I'd make your life easier by doing one here. <laughs> so there they are. They could, take the, uh, they could walk. It's going to take a long time. Environmentally, it's good. Or they could take any of those three routes, but there's risk of an accident. <laughs> but they will eventually get to the hospital. The approach that results in consenting for death and circumcision... John, I'm going to have to ask you to finish now. This is the last slide. It denies professionalism. It denies the patient the benefit of specialist knowledge in the consultation. It denies the patient learned wisdom. It's based on a legal premise that itself is based on the flawed idea of medicine. It attempts to, attempts to hand over all responsibility to the patient. And it acts to protect the doctor whilst frightening the patient. And lastly, it means we practice medicine as lawyers and not as doctors. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jonathan. So I'd like to ask uh, David to come to the podium. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Well, uh, my confession to start with is that when John asked me to uh, second him for this, uh, I can honestly say that I'd never consented for death in a circumcision uh, during my life uh, to date. But uh, times have changed, uh, although uh, the uh, quote on the bottom, I think, is still true a thousand years later on. Uh, consent has changed too. At the Elliott Smith Clinic in Oxford, uh, before it shut, there were 40,000 uh, vasectomies done. The one that came to court was one where the question was, had the patient been consented not for death but for recanalization, a one in two to 3,000 risk? Fortunately, they had, and it hadn't gone any further. Uh, what happened in 1981? In 1981, Mark Speakman and I were junior doctors in Bath. Uh, I'm uh, not sure that I can remember consenting anybody for death, regardless of the uh, operation. In 1991, in Oxford at the Ackland Hospital, I did my first private case, which was an nephrectomy. In those days at the Ackland, there was no consent form. Joe Smith, my senior colleague, uh, said to me when I asked him about that once, he said, actually, if they turn up for uh, an operation there, they are deemed to have consented. Uh, it used to be the risk, whether it was one in a hundred or less, but now it's the severity. Uh, vasectomy, uh, I know of one case uh, locally who had four years gangrene after a vasectomy. And there are deaths after circumcision, rare though they are. And uh, we've had two deaths. Fortunately, I don't do any prostatic biopsies, but there have been two deaths over the years uh, locally from prostatic biopsy, uh, which means that I think it's terribly important, especially if you're over 80, that you're consented for death after prostatic biopsy. And then maybe a lot of people would not have unnecessary prostatic biopsies, and you could just wait until their PSA goes up to 40 and give them 50 milligrams of biclutamide. But death is a severe event. Uh, when I came up yesterday, I was just looking at my sat-nav and noticed this, which was very interesting, that uh, failure to pull, pay full attention to the operation of your vehicle could result in death, serious injury. Now, uh, we all do take risks. Uh, my son on the left had to decide whether that rhino was sufficiently sedated to be able to put a blindfold around it before they uh, removed its horn to stop the poachers uh, getting the horn. And the one on the right was taken by a friend of mine who saw this on his neighbor's house. And of course, you've got to decide uh, whether that's safe to do or not. But of course, these are risks that the patient themselves take. It's like uh, whether you take the bus or whether you walk from Ainsham to the John Radcliffe Hospital, that's not John Raynard's responsibility, that's the patient's responsibility. But the question is, is that a responsibility that one would take? And of course, you don't have to say, 
uh, that uh, you know, you've got a high likelihood of dying after a circumcision, but to say that you may, in one in 50,000 cases, have a, a life-threatening infection as a result of this is something that's quite easy to say, and it might uh, stop you uh, avoiding those two words uh, during your career. Thank you very much. So, Mark, thank you. Thank you very much. So this house believes it's correct that patients having a circumcision are consented for death. What we're really debating is this house believes that all patients having a circumcision are consented for death. I consented a patient for death for a circumcision only two weeks ago, but that is an extremely rare event for a very elderly, very sick man with severe BXO. What we're really talking about is minor surgery or perhaps children having routine surgery. We saw good common sense at the beginning, so let's keep that going and make sure we all vote no at the end. Now, we all know a lot about debate and its history, but the key things about a debate, really, are that there's an audience involved, and therefore your opinion really matters. You've got the ability to ask us all questions using modern technology, so please do so. Now, it's already been said, but to me, the single most important thing, the most valuable thing about being a doctor is the trust that our patients give us. And that's trust that we'll give them good advice. It's trust that we'll explain what's going to happen to them, that we'll do a good surgical procedure, and then we'll tell them what the future might look like. And it's all about respecting that trust. If that breaks down, we're no different from any other form of work, accountants, or whatever else we want to look at. Now we've got two very good opponents who are suggesting the opposite course, both John and David. They are highly intellectual men. They're both highly educated men, and of course, men of Oxford. Therefore, I'd like to use a quote from another man of Oxford, namely William Osler. Common sense in matters medical is rare, and is usually in inverse ratio to the degree of education. <laughs> and here, we are clearly looking at an issue of common sense. Because if we're going to tell a patient they might die, we have to tell them what the risk is. And we don't know. In 1979, one in 6,000. Bollinger suggested on American data it might be one in 11,000. I talked to the last president of the British Association of Pediatric Surgery. He thought in children there was about one death every three years in the UK. And remember, two-thirds of circumcisions in the UK are done on children. Patients don't understand risk. Patients don't understand that when they buy a lottery ticket, their chance of dying before the Saturday draw is far greater than the one in 14 million chance that they might win the jackpot. So they don't understand numbers anyway. They just respect that we will make the right decision for them. But let's think particularly about circumcision in children. And I do lots of it. I do the basic pediatric urology in Taunton. So recently, I thought I would talk to some of my patients about the possibility that death might occur. And all they elicited was total horror from the patients. They clearly really did not want to get involved. I thought I'd do another little study. I have three sons, and each of my three sons has a son themselves. And I asked them, would they want to know the risk? They felt no. But they did say, Dad, but what is the risk? And I said, well, in all honesty, I don't really know. So perhaps circumcision isn't the best thing. What about transrectal ultrasound and biopsy? It's got a significantly higher mortality rate, and by and large, it's in a patient group who are probably more reluctant to proceed, and therefore knowing that there is a chance they might die could actually influence their decision. And in my support of this, I want to use this really good book by Andy Ripley. Andy Ripley was an outstanding rugby player for Leicester, England, and the British Lions, and in 2005 was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and in 2010 died. And he went to see one of our colleagues. This isn't me, Mr. S., he went and said, Mr. S was at point, pains to point out there was a small risk of infection as well as a risk of bleeding. I think there may have been some sort of NHS ruling that doctors were obliged to tell patients all the potential side effects. I suppose it's a good thing because patients are then prepared for the worst. But maybe it's also done because patients, doctors and hospitals are living in an increasingly litigious culture. If you happen to be among the unlucky 
and this is his word, say 5% that picks up an unlikely side effect. Maybe it's good to be aware of it, and it might happen. And maybe the hospital has to protect itself and does need a bit of paper signed by you. However, he says, it's also the risk of increasing the high anxiety level. So clearly, here's a top rugby player saying that a low risk is 5%, and we're talking one in tens of thousands, and he probably wouldn't want to know. We've already touched on the GMC, and in fact, everything that's in the Montgomery report is already in the GMC documents. It's not new. We have to give people information tailored to their needs. But the GMC also says consent process is not a snapshot. It's not that piece of paper. It is the ongoing process. So Joe Smith wasn't completely wrong when he said the patient walking into hospital is a big part of the consenting process. It has to start in outpatients. So that's true. When are we going to bring up the death? When are we going to tell the patient? Am I going to tell them that there is a small chance that little Johnny might die and then they worry for four or five months on a waiting list? Or do I tell them 30 seconds before they go down to theater that it might happen and they panic for the next 45 minutes? It's a difficult decision. And there's no doubt Montgomery is a landmark case and it's this balance between patient autonomy and medical paternalism. But patients want our respect, they want our information. And the decision in fact in Montgomery simply reflects best practice, so I'm not completely against it. There have been several cases post Montgomery. Spencer versus Hillingdon was a man who had a hernia repair who then got bilateral pulmonary emboli. And he sued because he had a delayed presentation because he wasn't aware that leg swelling followed by shortness of breath could mean something serious. The judge considered Montgomery and, and ruled against the health authority. However, Mrs. E took East Kent Health to to the courts because she had a baby using intracytoplasmic sperm injection who got a chromosomal abnormality and apparently they'd failed to warn her of this. But the judge said, using Montgomery, that a reasonable patient, including Mrs. E, would not have applied significance to that risk because she was so keen to proceed and ruled against her. So I would say to you colleagues that doctors are not liable for every omission of disclosure to which a patient later objects but that we have to judge what's appropriate for each patient and how their judgment, that's our judgment, might be assessed in the courts if it happened. And this is part of a very good article in the BMJ last year. So in conclusion, if your only function is to save your own skin, then certainly consent all patients for death. Otherwise, put the care of your patient and with circumcision, the care of the parents, ahead of your own irrational fears. And please consistently carry on with what you did at the beginning and vote no. Thank you very much. Okay, so, so thank, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, what we're going to do now is um, have some questions from the audience, but uh, I'd like to begin with one that's been uh, put by Chris Harding. So I'd like to go down the panel and start with you, David. And uh, Chris has asked, where do we start with the line of inclusion of death on a consent form? Flexible cystoscopy, DRE? Uh, I think the way that I would do it now, having uh, spoken to John, is uh, just to say that there is an extremely small risk of serious uh, life-threatening uh, infection after this and uh, you know John was saying that with uh, circumcision it's one in 50,000 and uh, just uh, probably say that just at the end of the uh, uh, at the end of the consultation but to just make the point that it is incredibly low risk. Jonathan. Uh, well actually my particular take on the Renardogram is particularly relevant because I had was doing a flexible cystoscopy list uh, some cases at Guy's uh, once, and I had a patient who I was expecting to turn up and didn't turn up, and I contacted him, and he'd had a car accident on the way into the hospital, and I hadn't advised him of the best route he should take. Um, I don't consent patients for death for, for cystoscopy. In fact, guys, we don't take a formal consent, uh, signed consent for cystoscopy. Mark? Well, I mean, I'd agree with that. I think the difficult question within this is what is the cut-off point? And I don't think we have an answer to that. I mean, Clearly, we mentioned it with nephrectomies, but as I said, I consented a man for a circumcision for death because his risks were so high. So I think it's a very difficult question. I can't give you an answer whether the risk is a risk of one in 5,000, 10,000, or 200,000. Right. And John? Uh, that, that, the man on the Clapham Omnibus um, needs our opinion 
about options for treatments and the outcomes of those treatments. Uh, and once we've given those options, it's up to him to decide whether he thinks the risks um, outweigh the benefits. He, he, he is absolutely reliant on our experience over many years of outcomes, but he is entitled to an opinion. And I, I, the bottom line is, this is all about respecting autonomy. It's not about me protecting myself. It's not about me protecting the medical profession. It's about respecting autonomy. That's a right that we all have. Well, can I press you a little bit? Do you, do you or don't you, respecting autonomy, if the patient comes in for a flexible cystoscopy, man with hematuria in his 80s, do you say to him that this could potentially happen? I, I can't ever remember anybody having a serious outcome like that after um, a flexible cystoscopy. I, um, Okay. So incredibly rare. Tim, on number two. Amazing uh, debate. Well done, everyone. Really enjoyed it. John, um, so that someone's properly informed about what serious infection means, I mean, you're showing them words. They don't really know what serious infection means unless you show them the picture of the Fourniers. Do you show every patient who's having circumcision the picture of the Fourniers so they're properly informed about what I, Fourniers I means? I don't show them the picture, but I do say to Why them, don't you show them the picture? Because that would help um, I, them understand I, yes, what would Fourniers mean. No, I agree. I think it's a good idea, Tim. I, what I do say to them is, look, the great majority of people will make a completely uncomplicated recovery following this procedure. I have heard of one case in 30 years in Oxford amongst thousands and thousands of circumcisions where the guy developed a severe infection requiring debridement over a number of days. But I didn't really understand what Mr. Reynard meant by serious infection. When he said serious infection, so then I, I didn't realise that. He well, didn't show me a picture of serious then infection. Then I can start showing the picture. And a picture, well, and a picture following the debridement. You're haranguing the witness there, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I'm going to move to number one, please. Uh, Farooq Qureshi from Bristol. Uh, these days, I mainly do co-urology, and that scrotal surgery is part of it. Um, I don't know what the panel does. Do you always see your own patients? I don't. They come f to me from a pool of patients I've never seen before. If well, I start well, one telling is, them... One is reliant on one's colleagues. So you have actually a group of patients. You have about... 15 consultants at Bristol and a big group of clinical fellows and about 25 people who anyone could have seen them. How much they told them about a circumcision, I don't know, but I do tell them. And so the mini clinic starts in the morning, so the list never starts on time. If I was to tell them every time that there's a risk of death, I don't know, about 50% would say, well, we weren't told about this. So I don't know. Uh, well, as I say, I think you need to rely on your colleagues, and if you can't rely on your colleagues, what can you rely on? If someone hasn't been consented for a serious outcome by one of your colleagues and ends up on your operating list, the responsibility falls to you. It doesn't mean you can just give up your responsibility. I'm just going to go to the iPad for a moment because mm. there's, there's a question here, and it says, radiologists perform prostate biopsies requested by urologists. Uh, who is responsible for the consent? I would have thought it's pretty clear. David, who's responsible? Uh, well, uh, presumably they um, do it after the patient's been seen in clinic. So I think uh, when you see them in clinic, you ought to talk to them. And then the radiologist uh, should talk to them as well. I would have thought it's uh, the responsibility of both people who've seen them. Okay. <clears throat> so moving to microphone two now. Thank you. Uh, Sanjeev Agrawal from London. Uh, two points. One is that there is uh, something about good medical practice as to what uh, a, a, a significant body of your colleagues would do in that position. So we had a poll with 88% or maybe 90% saying no to a consent. So there is an argument that a majority of, of urologists in this country would not consent. So if it comes to court of law, that's just one point I was going to make. And the second point, I really take Jonathan's view uh, very seriously, that how far are we going to consent? Uh, and I'll give you one example. Um, I do pediatric urology. So I did a okidopexy in an inguinal um, ch child who had an um, inguinal testicle. 
Now, it was normally takes me about 45 minutes to an hour. It took, this took an hour and a half because intraoperatively, this was an intra-abdominal testicle. So I came out and said, look, it took a half an hour extra. She said, the mother said, I'm a lawyer. You did not consent the possibility of it being an intra-abdominal testicle, which will take half an hour longer, and hence has more complications. And if you had told that, I would not have gone ahead with the surgery. So, you know, there's just no limit you can stop. And I think at some point, you just have to look at Jonathan's point, what is in the best interest of the patient and what do you think is best and the reason body all of evidence. Uh, you see, that, that's, a, that's a fundamental misunderstanding. If, if you're unconscious and you cannot consent, then the surgeon has to act in your best interests. If you're awake and you have your mental faculties, it's up to you to decide what is in your best interest. This idea of what is in the best interests for a conscious, um, compass mentors patient is nonsense. Okay, thank you. I think that's John Davies and number two. John. Yeah, you wanted me to comment. Thanks, very clever debate. I've, I've never seen this topic debated, so it's great. Uh, a couple of things. Um, let me loop one point in from yesterday about just, you know, the BGOI speaker, Dr. Watcher, mentioned how in the digitization era, you have known consequences of improvements, but also some unintended issues. So in the consent arena, a benefit of digitization is that when they check in for theater, the nurses can very quickly see that the consent's been done, it's easy to checklist. On the other hand, what I've noticed, is, especially Epic, if it's coming to the UK, is patients can't access the consent. Like if they, they log into their personal account, they can't really get the consent. In the old paper version, you usually would put it in their lap and they would read it and sign it. Now it's up on a screen, they're given a little box to sign. And I've actually, my observation and concern is that they're actually not reading it. They see it on a screen um, and they, unless you go to another room and print it for them, I'm actually not sure they're going through it line by line unless they've got kind of an engineering kind of a personality. The other quick uh, comment I would say, so like for, for the big surgeries, I'm gonna just start putting blank consents in their patient information because I'm actually worried they're not taking it seriously. On the anxiety thing, the phrase I use in clinic that seems to help with anxiety is when something's low risk, I just say it's really low risk, but it's not zero. And, and that seems to be an anxiety relieving phrase that kind of works across the board. The last thing I'll say in the American context, we, most hospital templates have had the phrase stroke, heart attack, and death on every generic consent for decades, so, so much that people are numb to it and are not nervous about it because it's just, they just kind of say, well, it's part of uh, the lawyer speak of getting a procedure done. I'm not sure people, maybe, maybe it's been different over here, but we've had it on everything for years. It's just okay. interesting. Thanks, John. I'm going to come back to a question that's posed, and it says, has any of you ever asked the patient how much they know about the planned procedure and what they would consider to be the worst case scenario outcome? Is that a legitimate way to proceed? David, can I start? Uh, with you? Well, I often ask them whether they uh, understand the procedure and what's going to happen. I do that all the time. I don't think I've ever asked them what they think the worst case scenario would be. Jonathan. Yeah, no, I, I'm the same. I, I, I don't think patients can imagine very often what the worst case scenario is because we have information inevitably that they don't have. And I don't, I, I think suggesting that this is, I have less interest in their autonomy than uh, the medical legal uh, perspective, I don't think is correct. I have a huge uh, interest in their autonomy, but I also believe that we as a body of uh, sub uh, specialists have advice that we can uh, help them to make, to let them use their autonomy to come to the right decision. And we shouldn't just be presenting a um, cold information without putting any advice to that information. But, um, Thank you. So, Mark and then John. I think this is the one thing we probably will all agree on, actually. I think it's a key thing in the GMC guidance that we should be testing the patient's understanding of what we've told them. And I think most of us forget to do it a lot of the time. I think the only thing I do in my defense is I always make sure I say, is there anything you want to ask me? Because I think there's a d danger that it's a, a one-way thing and we're giving them information. What I'm talking about here, of course, is the consenting piece of paper, which, as I say, is only the final bit of what should be a long process. Okay. Now, the, the debate title was The House Believes It's Correct that Patients Having a Circumcision uh, Are Consented for Death. So, John, would you mind coming up to the podium in one minute? 
uh, sum up, and then that'll be followed immediately by Jonathan, and then we'll, we'll take a vote again. Uh, we are entitled to um, give people our opinion about how good ureteroscopy versus lithotripsy is, for example, breaking up stones and what the risks of all of that are. We're entitled to have an opinion about that because we see the outcomes of that procedure every single day of the week. Um, but where we're not entitled to have an opinion is about what the patient thinks the, the risks and benefits of that particular procedure are. So in every other respect of practice, of course we can express our opinion. But when it comes down to what the patient thinks is a risk, that is up to the patient to decide, and that is respecting autonomy. Thank you. Johnson. Uh, um, it is absolutely clear that a single consent for consent process that denies the individual uh, in front of you the nuanced consultation that he, he or she is entitled to and the wisdom of your experience is what's important. As Mark has said, on occasions when you have a patient who is 87 and frail and for whatever reason needs a general anaesthetic circumcision or a local anaesthetic circumcision and they have little reserve, consenting them for death may be relevant. But we're talking about the average patient and what we're doing by treating all patients the same and putting consent on the death form is denying the patients the nuanced consultation. And although they may have autonomy, they don't actually really under know the risks for their particular set of circumstances. And we should be giving them advice based on what we uh, understand from the, uh, to do with the individual in front of us. I think consenting for death is wrong. Thanks, Jonathan. So if we could have the final slide, please, and if you could take out your iPads or your phones. And so the question is, when patients give, con uh, well, will you in future discuss the possibility of death with your patient when they're undergoing a circumcision or indeed a minor procedure? Right, so there has been a little bit of a shift. So now currently 27 and no 73%. So it only remains for me to thank my panel for a, a fantastic hour. Uh, well done. Thank you.